As humans, we are constantly receiving feedback from our surroundings or from inside and translating this to input, signals which lead to a specific action. The challenge with an exoskeleton is how to translate all of these natural processes into robotic ones. In this video, we'll see what different kinds of feedback and input we experience as humans. We'll then discuss why it's important for our pilot to be able to give input to the exoskeleton and the many different methods which exist to provide input. So what are feedback and input? Feedback are signals that we receive. The feedback we receive as humans can come from two different sources, our surroundings and our internal system. With our surroundings, we use our five senses, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, and feeling. With these senses, we pick up on surrounding feedback. We, for instance, see trees in our way or hear an alarm. And from our internal system, we also receive feedback on how our body is doing. We might feel hungry or our heart rate might pick up as we feel nervous. All of the feedback that we receive is translated as signals to our brain, where they are then processed. We use these processed signals to shape our input, a signal which we give. For example, our eyes may see a staircase coming and thus we process this feedback and decide to climb these stairs. Now, there are different levels on which you could define this input to happen. If you think about providing input on a high level, you can define this action as climbing stairs. On a lower level, it's a thought to just take one step. And on an even lower level, you would first encounter the action to move your knee. Providing input can thus happen on different levels, which is important to remember as we discuss later different methods to provide input to exoskeletons. But first, let's discuss why it's important for a pilot to be able to provide input to an exoskeleton. By now, I hope you remember that our pilots have a spinal cord injury, which means they cannot control nor feel their own legs. The legs of the exoskeleton have become their new legs, and thus they need a new way to communicate with these legs. Most importantly, the second reason is that the pilots want to have control of the exoskeleton. You can compare this to driverless cars. Although it seems exciting to be able to relax behind the steering wheel, we want to be in control of the thing we're moving in. It's the same with driverless cars. You yourself can still decide on the location you want to go and the route you will take to get there. Remember the le different levels of providing input we discussed? It's an interesting question to consider from an exoskeleton perspective. Do you want the pilot to be able to simply choose the location they want to walk to? and then not be able to give any other kind of input? Or do you want the pilot to be able to choose exactly the different knee angles and velocity of the steps? Each of these levels has their own advantages and disadvantages. The less the pilot is in control, the more the exoskeleton can be pre-programmed and the quicker the pilot can learn how to walk in it. It takes us a few years to learn how to walk as babies, but it takes dedication if it takes such a long time to learn how to walk. If the pilot has more control of the exoskeleton, this also means that the exoskeleton must be able to be controlled on that level. In other words, you would have a lot more aspects on which your pilot has to provide input, and your exoskeleton needs to be able to handle this. But this level of control does offer your pilot more freedom in how they want to move. Now, we don't say that one level is better than the other, but just want you to think about the difference these levels make and how to balance the advantages and disadvantages. So let's take a look at the different methods which exist to provide input for exoskeletons. Some of these are very similar to the input that you and I provide every day to the objects around us. Others are not so common. We'll discuss four different methods. First, there's speech, which we use, for instance, when saying, hey, Alexa, play. The second one is brain-machine interaction, which is when either internally or on the outside of our skull, electromagnetic wavelengths are measured. 
The third one is motion detection, which can be hand gestures in front of a sensor, or also, for instance, eye movement or a motion tracker on a body part. The last one we refer to as device. It contains a lot of different submethods. On a device, for instance, there can be buttons, keys, touchscreens, or touchpads. The most obvious examples here are, of course, our computers and our phones. Now, those are the basic methods that you might be familiar with. But how do these methods work in exoskeletons? We'll give you an overview of some of the methods which exist already. Now, bear in mind that there are a lot more options than what we show you here. The first one of speech, however, there's not yet an exoskeleton which is voice controlled. At Project March, we decided against using voice recognition because it isn't as reliable as the method we currently use. Should voice recognition become more robust and reliable in the future, then there is another alternative, which we think will be more intuitive for the pilots. That method is brain-machine interaction. There are two exoskeletons which use this method. The Mindwalker and the Teratuct Exo both have their pilots wear caps with electromagnetic wave sensors in them. These caps are less invasive than having sensors integrated in your brain. But the signals which come from the caps are also less reliable. An advantage of this method is that if it works, it will be almost exactly if the exoskeleton's legs are your own. You think about walking and then the exoskeleton will just walk. Disadvantages at this moment are just that the method is not yet that reliable. And it also still looks kind of weird. That's something that we want to keep in mind as well. You don't want the pilot to be embarrassed to go outside with the exoskeleton. Providing input via motion detection isn't widely used yet with exoskeletons. There's not yet a team which uses smart glasses to detect eye movement or an exoskeleton which can be controlled with hand movement alone. Now, there are some exoskeletons which can be controlled by a movement, but this is always by moving some kind of device. Again, remember that our pilots don't have that much control over their upper body and then need their arms and hands to use the crutches. Here you can see a pilot moving an exoskeleton by moving his crutches. This is happening with the Symbitron exoskeleton. The exoskeleton can be controlled in some way by moving the crutches in a certain direction. The most used method to provide input to an exoskeleton is, however, by using a device. Since most exoskeletons still require the pilot to use crutches to keep their balance, the input device is usually integrated in the crutch. This is the case, for example, in the twice exoskeleton. An exception to this trend is the rewalk, which is controlled via a device in the wristband. So in this video, we've covered what feedback and input exactly is. Why it is important for the pilot to be able to give input to an exoskeleton and the many different ways in which you can do this. Next up is a short quiz on the advantages and disadvantages of all of these methods. And if you want to know more about different methods to provide input in exoskeletons, we also have some reading materials ready for you. Then check out the next video on how our input device was made at Project March.